So, um, uh, I had reached uh, Badrinath after a great deal of travel. It took me about three months roughly to reach uh, Badrinarayan. And uh, as I said, the priests of Badrinarayan are Nambudris from Kerala. So I went to see the priest, to see the Ravalji, they are called Ravalji's. And I had a meeting with him. Interesting. Uh, I was given the name of Shiva Prasad at uh, Aridwar by the Mahamandaleshwar whom I had met first. So I maintained that name. So when Ravalji asked me, what is your name? I said, Shiva Prasad. Hmm. Because I thought these Nambudris are such orthodox people from Kerala Brahmins. So I thought better to stick to Shiva Prasad. So I said, Shiva Prasad. Ah, very good, he said. So, you finished your college? I said, almost. Mm -hmm. So, why are you here? I said, I came looking for uh, gurus because I have heard in the Himalayas there are great uh, yogis still living who might be able to guide me because I need, I am looking for a true and original guru. He started laughing. Then uh, he said, I have not met a single genuine soul here. I was shocked. I said, how is this possible? He said, maybe I have, I am not sure, but most of these pseudo sadhus all around here, uh, some of them are very rich. Some, and he gave me such a critical view of this whole thing that I began to wonder, is it right to ask, it was wrong to ask this man. Anyway, I said, all right, but can you find me a place to stay? He said, yeah, that I can find you. I will find a kutir for you across the river, across Alakananda. Stay for some time, you can get all your food from here because the priests of Badrinath are from Kerala. Badrinarayan regularly gets Kerala food to eat. Mm -hmm. So I decided I will also get good food and I stayed on. I was missing the food for quite some time. So uh, I stayed on. But every time I met uh, Ravalji, he used to discourage me. He said, I appreciate your search. But you can find it at home also. You are an educated man. You should go back, work for a living. See these buggers, they are all sadhus. This, okay. I kind of closed my ears and listened and heard everything that he said, but I didn't register. I was very upset. One day I was so upset. I was so uh, depressed that I decided that I will walk up to Mana, the last village on the border, which is full of Tibetan weavers, and then go to Vashishta Gufa, which somebody said is beyond, and see if there is anyone there. If I don't find a proper guru or a teacher, then it is better that I commit suicide, because maybe this body is not ready for spiritual instruction, maybe I am not fit for it. Maybe next time I will come back in a better body, in better circumstances and find a guru and find spiritual fulfillment. So I said to myself, I will go and see if I don't find anybody. I stood on the banks of the Alkananda and looked down. And in my mind I was calculating how many minutes it will take to die because the water flows very strongly with a roaring noise from the top. I said to myself, maybe two minutes I will be dead, finished. I will close my eyes, meditate and go. So when you discard the body, you get a better body and come back again for spiritual. With this in mind, do or die, I walked up. So I went up to Vyasa Gufa. There was nothing there. Vyasa Gufa now has become so busy, it's not worth going there. That time there was just a small cave. Then I further went up, almost up to Sorga Arohini near the rocks where the Saraswati river flows. There is a beam pool there. I went to beam pool, then I was quite depressed and I started walking down. On the way I had to pass the Vyas Gufa again. So when I reached Vyas Gufa, I found uh, that there was some fire inside. 
somebody must be there. There was a dhuni in the mouth of the Vyas Kufa. So if there is a dhuni, dhuni is the big fire which is lit by yogis who live in these areas, like a campfire. So I said, if there is a, there must be somebody inside. So I slowly went into the Vyasa Gufa, not expecting anybody, hoping to see some sadhu. I thought maybe I'll spend the night here and meditate. The moment I entered, this person came out of the cave. And I looked at him and it was the same it clicked immediately in my mind that this is the same person whom I have seen many years ago when I was a nine-year-old boy playing on the in the backyard of my house. <clears throat> the man who stood under the jackfruit tree and touched my head, this whole thing flashed into my mind. And I said, I think this is the same person. And Unconsciously, I exclaimed, Babaji, like that. So, and his uh, first statement was very interesting. He said to me, Acha ghoom phir ke aa gaye ya. You've gone round and round and come back to me. So I prostrated before him and I said, Now all my life, till I die, I'm not going to leave you. And he said, Dekha jayega, we'll think about it. But then, from that time, for three and a half years, I spent with him, following him wherever he went, learning what he taught, eating what he provided, and living as he wanted me to live. Three and a half years as he traveled, I also traveled. And that night we spent at Vyas Kufa, the next day morning, he took me away from there. We crossed the river, went to a, a place called Charanapaduka, which is behind the Badrinath temple, which has many caves. As you proceed further up, you see caves on the right side from Charanapaduka. If you go further, it used to be the old route to Kedar, but nobody goes on that way now because it's all broken and ice filled. <clears throat> so, in one of those caves in Charanapaduka is the place where Babaji used to live. Now, when I say Babaji, many people would immediately think that I am talking about Mahavatar Babaji, about whom Yogananda Paramahamsa has written in the autobiography of a yogi. I think uh, in recent times, Rajni Kant also made a movie on Babaji. No, I'm not talking about that Babaji. I'm talking about someone whose name was Maheshwarnath Babaji. We used to call him Babaji. In Hindi, Babaji means Appa, father. It means father, mother, everything. So great saints are addressed as Babaji. Maheshwarnath Babaji belonged to the Nath Sampradaya, <coughs> which is a very old tradition in India starts with Adinath, who is considered to be <coughs> none other than Shiva himself. And from there, Machindranath, and from Machindranath to Goraknath, from Goraknath to the other Naths. Goraknath is the most famous of the Nath Sampradaya saints, and his headquarters is in Gorakhpur, which is on the border of Nepal almost. Now, Maheshwarnath Babaji belonged to the Nath Sampradaya on one side. And on the other side, he was a direct disciple of Sri Guru Babaji, who is referred to in the autobiography as Mahavatar Babaji. In our tradition, in our parampara, we don't call him Mahavatar. We call him Sri Guru Babaji. Because Mahavatar was a word coined by uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda because this particular being is supposed to have lived for so many years. Many other avatars have come and gone, but he continues to live. So he gave the title of Mahavatar. And the picture of uh, Babaji, Sri Guru, 
we called him Sri Guru Baba Ji. He was my Guru's Guru. So normally when I say Baba Ji, I refer to Maheshwarnath Baba Ji, who was his disciple, direct disciple. Now there is a picture of Mahavatar Baba Ji or Sri Guru Baba Ji in the autobiography of a yogi. Now that picture is a painting done by the brother of Yogananda Paramahamsa based on a description given by Yogananda Paramahamsa who said that he had seen Sri Guru Baba Ji in a vision. Not actually, but in a vision. This is the picture. Now why I am mentioning this is because one day when I was walking with Maheshwarnath Baba Ji, whom I said continue to refer as Baba Ji, in Badrinath, I told him that this beautiful picture of our Paramaguru, Sri Guru Baba Ji, is there in the autobiography of Yogi, it's beautiful which I had read. He said, ah, it is beautiful, it's an artist's rendering, but there is another picture which is even more uh, identical to as Babaji looks. So I asked him, where is it? So he said, it is hanging in the bedroom of the Ravalji at Badrinath. So I said, shall we go and see it? He said, Abhi nahi, not now. So I kept quiet. I was like that. He always, when he blew, blew the whistle, I shook my tail and went. And when he blew the whistle, I went away. So when he said, don't want, I said, don't want, fine. Once I even told Babaji, he said, what do you think about yourself? You and me. I said, I think of myself as a dog sitting in front of you, looking at you, listening to you. His master's voice, HMV. And he said, but don't shake your tail too much. Zyada dum nahi hilana, he said. Anyway, so that was our So I said, okay, fine. Many years later, and then he gave me the history of how that picture of Sri Guru Baba Ji came to be in the Ravalji's room in Badrinath. Ravalji is the chief priest of the temple. He said there was one priest, one of the Ravalji's, who was a great bhakta of Badrinarayan. So he used to go off when he was not doing puja, free hours, to the back of the temple and meditate in Charana Paduka. So one day when he was meditating in Charana Paduka, he saw a vision. He saw somebody, not vision, he actually saw somebody. Now, according to Babaji, it was Sri Guru. But the Ravalji thought that it was a vision of Badri Narayan, sitting in Padmasad. In Badri Narayan is the only form of Narayana who sits in Padmasana in meditative pose. So when he came back home to his room, he was an amateur artist. So using vegetable colors, he painted a picture of whom he saw, who he thought was Badri Narayan, but it is Sri Guru or Mahavatar or whatever you want to call him. That picture was lying in in the room of the bedroom of the Ravalji's for many years. This was the picture. And that is the picture which I have used in the in my autobiography. You will find a picture of Sri Guru Babaji, which is a copy of uh, the picture that hangs even today in the bedroom of the Ravalji's. Now the Ravalji's have come to know that it is Sri Guru. So they have cut out, taken prints and kept it in front. When they sit, there is also a picture of Babaji there. Now, this picture came to me because when once we went to Badri Kedar in Rishikesh, Nanu came with us and he is an amateur photographer, but he is almost a professional. So he had a beautiful camera, which looked somewhat like here. And with that, we went to then um, Ravalji and asked his permission, can we take a picture? They didn't know at that time what it was. They said, it has been lying here for years. It is a painting of Badri Narayan. They said, can we take a picture of that? He said, no problem. Vishnu Nambudri Pad was the Ravalji at that time. So then Nanu, uh, with his uh, camera and lights and all that, he took a close-up of that and then he printed it and distributed it to us and uh, 
that is the picture that you will find in my autobiography history it is very similar to the one in autobiography yogi but it is a little more according to baba ji more resemblance to sri guru baba ji and it is a little roughly done it's not very finely done anyway so i stayed with baba ji with maheshwar nath baba ji in the cave uh, at uh, charana paduka behind the badrinath temple and i spent many days with him off and on we used to travel and come back again stay there many of the lessons which i learned many of the much of the knowledge that i had gained which is with me today and because of which i am able to teach people those who want to learn came from those days of instruction in charana paduka i also i learned not only how to study vedanta how to practice meditation or how to practice kriya yoga which is our parampara i also learned how to cut vegetables how to cook food how to go for bhiksha how to keep the kutir clean baba ji told me once if you cannot cut vegetables properly you cannot understand vedanta he was a real task master and a real teacher who taught me every little thing how to live what to do of course i may not have been such a perfect disciple so i might commit mistakes but this was the teaching the instruction and it was he was more than a father and mother i think he was father mother friend all guru all rolled into one i never kept anything in my mind i exposed my mind to him and he worked on it in his own way sometimes actual work sometimes invisible work which you cannot make out until the results come forth so this was my life with sri with uh, maheshwarnath baba ji now before i uh, in uh, my story about sri maheshwarnath baba ji i must mention one more thing which is that uh, he was one of the oldest and the earliest direct disciples of sri guru baba ji and in the autobiography of a yogi there is a mention of um lahri mahashay who was a very shyamacharan lahri was a very advanced yogi and a disciple of uh, mahavatar baba ji so in that story in the autobiography there is a mention of lahri mahashay going to the himalayas and meeting shri guru baba ji in the cave that cave is still there uh, it's in up near dwarahat now in that baba ji sent somebody to him to shama charan lehri saying go and bring him inside and show him something now this person who was sent by him to fetch shama charan lehri inside was maheshwarnath baba ji it's not his name is not mentioned in the autobiography because the author of the autobiography did not know who he was he has only mentioned that he sent one of his advanced disciples to bring him inside this is maheshwarnath baba ji now how did he look his picture is there in my autobiography it is not a photograph it's also a painting because sri guru baba ji was dead against being photographed he always resisted being photographed and knowing that i was myself an amateur artist he prohibited me from painting or drawing any likeliness of himself because he was very he he was he was against any form of people worshiping him in any way he was a man who walked barefoot all along the himalayas or even when he came back down the himalayas barefoot no ashram no organization no banner the only thing he possessed was a white cloth which reached from the waist to the knees and a kamandalu and a rudraksha mala on his neck there was nothing else that he possessed not even a pair of hawai chappals and he never got into any vehicle he always walked no bus no car always walking and therefore i was also forced to walk with him wherever he went whenever i was with him 
He was a thin, tall man, well built, very fair, with a sparse beard and moustache, and with his hair, matted hair, jata, tied up like a big cord on the top of the head. His eyes were the most extraordinary, because very often questions which were difficult to be understood through discussion and argument could be understood by his mere look into your eyes. That was a, the most special quality of Babaji that I know of, that I have heard of. Anyway, so I lived with this great being for some years. Now I must tell you the story of Babaji's picture, which is now in the autobiography. How it came about? Even though Babaji had told me not to take a picture of him, not to photograph him, not to paint any picture of him, one day, in my innocence and ignorance, I decided that I would somehow get a photograph of his. Now that's an interesting story by itself. We used to live in Rishikesh for some time, in a place called the Gufa of Mauni Baba. Mauni Baba's uh, uh, cave, which is on the other side of the Ganga. In the evening, we used to cross over onto this side, sit on the banks of the Ganga in a quiet spot, and have a lot of discussions for one or two teaching sessions, Upanishads. I have studied many things sitting there. So, now this story which I am going to relate about Babaji's photograph is not in this autobiography. It will probably come in the sequel which is which I am working on now. So every evening we used to come across, sit on the steps and talk. One day in Lakshman Jula if you go, you will find lot of photographers there for tourists. They will say five minutes photograph and they will give it to you and the next day a print. So in that way I became very friendly with a young photographer, Ghadwali boy, who used to be hanging around Lakshman Jula. So one day I told him, why don't you do me a favor? In the evening I sit in such and such a spot and I have discussions with Babaji. You come there, you don't even show that you know me, you come from the guard side, keep photographing everything, in between take a quick shot of Babaji also and then walk up and then don't see me, tomorrow I will see you and take the photograph. Ah, he agreed. So that evening, around 5, I was becoming more and more nervous. I thought, suppose Babaji comes to know somehow and he says, today we won't cross to that side, what will happen? But promptly at 5 o'clock he said, chalte hain us taraf. So I said, okay, fine. As of now, everything is working according to my plan. So we came on to the side. We sat down on the steps of the ghat, the upper steps, and we started discussing something. Uh, I waited. I couldn't find this photographer anywhere. And so many people were coming and going, but there is no photographer. So we waited till around dusk when the sun is about to set. At about 6.30, Babaji suddenly said to me, Oh, tomorrow photographer abhi nahi aayega. He said that photographer, your photographer is not going to turn up now. I had not mentioned to him about the photographer at all in the first place. So I was shocked. So I, I, I fell at his feet and sought forgiveness. I said, Babaji, I am very sorry. I so value your photograph that I somehow wanted to do it. I won't, I won't repeat this ever. I am very, very sorry about this. So Babaji said, doesn't matter, it is all right. And we went back to the cave, to Mohini Baba's cave. And that day, that evening in Mohini Baba's cave, I got a beautiful discussion. I got a beautiful lesson on photography. It was very beautiful. He said, suppose your photographer had come. Suppose. And he had clicked. What if my picture wouldn't have come? How would you stop it? 
I said, how can you stop it, Babaji? Because if, if a photographer clicks, it will certainly come in the film. He said, what is, how does an image come in the camera? I said, how? He said, if there is an image and if light falls on it, that light reflects back from the object and goes to the lens and you get the picture. Suppose I know some way by which I can prevent the light that falls on me from reflecting back. Is it possible to take a photograph? I said, no. He said, that is what would have happened. If the photographer had come, he would not have got a picture. He would probably have got a black outline. That's all he could have got. Because all the light, when it's absorbed, it is black. If all the light is reflected together, it is white. So I got a nice uh, discussion on what light is and how it is affecting and how photography takes place. This whole thing. So this is the story of how I tried to photograph Babaji. Then how did I get the picture in the autobiography? Many years later, many years later, while in Madanapalli, one summer morning, I decided that I would uh, make a picture of Babaji because I thought that stricture was laid many years ago. Now it would have gone. So at least for my own satisfaction. So I, nobody was at home. I took a drawing board, fixed a white drawing paper onto it with pins, took Indian ink and a brush, black brush, and it, from my memory, I made a beautiful outline of Sri Guru Babaji. Now, it was a May day, May, mid-May, and there were no clouds anywhere there, no sign of rain, absolutely clear sky. I left it outside on the veranda to get some air. I had my lunch and went up to sleep. I woke up from the sleep when I heard rain, heavy rain. There was thunder. So, it suddenly occurred to me that I had kept a picture outside to dry. So, I came running down and what do I see? There water has and wind have completely wiped the thing out and there was only the soaked drawing paper sitting there. This was my first, second attempt at capturing Babaji. Then, when the autobiography was going to come out, I said it is unfair to the readers that we don't have Babaji's picture when I keep saying Babaji, Babaji, Babaji. Sri Guru Babaji is there. What about Maheshwarnath Babaji? So, I decided once more let me try an outline. So, I sat down and made an outline. There is an art teacher in our school, boarding school, in the People Grow School called Sharat. I took this drawing to him and I said to him, can you make some, some alterations to this and show me the result? Keep, show, make a few frames. He is a graphic designer also. So he made a few frames. I approved of one of them. And that picture is the one that you find in the autobiography. Now I will start from my first day at uh, the cave in Charanapaduka where I was living with Maheshwarnath Babaji. Now, there was something, some peculiarities about Babaji. One is, normally he didn't eat food. I mean, he would eat. Rarely when somebody offered food, or sometimes when I made, cooked a little bit of food, he would eat. But generally, he was not, I felt that he was not hungry, really. He would eat for satisfaction of others. The other peculiarity was that I never seen him sleep. When I say sleep, lying down and sleeping. Anytime I wake up, when I woke up and looked, he would be sitting straight, looking, sometimes eyes open, sometimes eyes closed. The maximum I have seen him rest is sometimes with his hands, he would lean backwards. And on the cave or near a tree or something like that, but never full stretched, never sleeping, I have not seen him. And he never felt sleepy because of that. He walked almost when we were walking 20 kilometers a day, 
and would not be tired at the end of it. This is something very peculiar which we have walked in so many places. And wherever he went, he had taught me how to collect dry firewood twigs and branches. He, he always carried an axe with him, small axe to cut the branches. And how to light the dhuni fire. Never did he stay in a place without a dhuni fire, which was part of the ritual of the Nata Sampradaya. Now, on the first day, he told me to go down to the village, village meaning the small settlement near the Badri temple, to a Marwadi's uh, shop and say that Babaji has asked for provisions. So I went and that man said, I can bring the provisions to the cave to Babaji. I said, please, I will be punished. He has asked me to bring it, so you don't come, I will take it. So I took some provision, which basically some rice and uh, a few other things. It is very difficult to cook things like dal in Badrinath because the air pressure is very, very low. So basically we did with rice and some alu, some potatoes and things like that, some chilies. So I brought it. He taught me how to wash it, how to cut it, how to cook it. And when I had prepared the meal, I think for my satisfaction, he took a little bit and ate it and said, Ah, it's very nice. I knew that it is only for my satisfaction. I was myself not sure how good it was. Anyway, then that evening he started his lessons of teaching me about yoga, about the nadis, about the shushumna, about the chakras, about the Upanishads, about the Gita. So many things, day by day, little by little. Each session would go around one hour or one and a half to two hours when we would sit and actually discuss the matter face to face, like in the Upanishads. If you read the Upanishads, you will see that the Rishi sits with his disciple and has a dialogue, samvad, which is a discussion. He is not told, ah, this is what it is, you have to accept it. There is a discussion. And after the discussion, one can ask questions and then absorb the knowledge which is given to one. This is the way I was taught throughout. It consisted of some words, discussions and dialogues between him and me. Of course, he knew and I didn't. That is always there, that difference. Anyway, then one of these days, and I used to sleep in the cave, and he used to sit near the dhuni looking out. One of these days, one of those days, he gave a big discussion. He, he talked about the fire. And he said, the fire that you see burning before you, which is Agni, which is, is one of the most important elements in the earth. And it is connected to the human being. Because in the human being, there is an inner fire which is in the area of the navel, the Manipura Chakra, which when awakened, the inner energy which is called the Kundalini is awakened, by which the human being ascends from, to the, low, from the lower level to the higher level of consciousness and finally reached freedom, which in yogic terms is called Kaivalya, which means absolutely unconditional, fetterless, free existence, not bound by any desire whatsoever, which is in full happiness because no one is, one is not seeking or craving for anything. To be free of even a single craving, like a craving to drink a cup of coffee or to smoke a cigarette itself is a great freedom. Now to live with no craving whatsoever, you can imagine what a wonderful freedom and blissful life it is. And for that, Babaji taught me that the inner fire, which is reflected in the outer fire, has to be kindled. He said that is the real Homa. He said the real Nachiketa Homa is the kindling of the inner fire in the Manipura Chakra and not lighting the fire outside. He said lighting the fire outside, goldsmiths also do, uh, blacksmiths also do to make, to melt their iron, but what spiritual benefit do you get out of it? 
He said the inner fire has to be lit, which is in the Manipur chakra, and that is called the Nachiketas fire discussed between Nachiketas and Yama in the great Upanishad called the Katha Upanishad, Katha Upanishad. And then Babaji never said anything only theoretical. When he said something, he always gave a practical demonstration of it. He said the fire is a living thing, it's not a non-living thing and he said look at the fire for some time so I fixed my attention on the fire which was lit he fixed his attention after a while he uttered a few bijaksharas of Agni and raised his hand up like this and I with my own eyes I saw the flame going straight up even as tall as a tree which was in the background and then, when I was completely astounded, wondering what was happening, he turned his finger like this, and the tip of that turned and hit me in my navel. And it was as if my whole body was on fire. Something was burning inside, and it was very hot, almost unbearable, but at the same time, quite blissful. I, I cannot describe this more than this. And then I found the energy slowly traveling up and coming to the middle of my forehead and I went into meditation. I remained in that meditation probably for the whole night because next morning I found Babaji shaking me up and saying, go and brush your teeth and get some provision to cook because you are hungry, not because he is hungry, you are hungry. So this was my first lesson and it was my first kindling of the fire inside which now I'm 64, 63 has not gone off that fire it's still kindled inside I mean if you talk this to a psychiatrist or a dog uh, you think that you're completely nuts you've gone out with a rocker but it is there the fire burns inside and it's not because it's not a physical fire it's the fire which also exhibits which which also manifests when a human being has desire irresistible desire for something only thing is here the desire fire has been converted into the fire that burns out all the impurities and the dross and takes one to the higher levels of consciousness this is called the kundalini fire and this was my first experience with Babaji a week later one day Babaji said Today is your chutti. You are free to go where you want. You can go where you want. It's like a holiday for you. So I decided now in the Himalayas, in that area, where would you go? There only, if you go a little further, there is ice. Otherwise, you can go to the temple. I didn't want to go back to see the Ravalji. So I decided to wander around somewhere near the caves. Further up, Six, seven caves further up, I saw a cave in which the smell of incense was coming, Shambrani. So I went inside and I saw a very wrinkled old Buddhist monk sitting there. He had a prayer wheel in his hand, rotating. And he was keep chanting, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. It was going on. And there was incense burning there. So I went and prostrated, did Namaskara and sat down. And after some time he said, I asked him, can you speak uh, English? You speak Hindi? He said, yes. So we started talking a little bit. And then I asked him about Buddhism and about various things and he gave me a lot of information on that. Then he suddenly said something which was quite extraordinary. When I asked him about in Tibetan yoga, the Tibetan lamas practice a certain thing called thummo. Thummo is a kind of pranayam with some visualizations where the inner heat in the system is generated. And they live in the coldest of climates and still don't feel cold because the body starts sweating when this fire is ignited in the navel, the inner fire. So this is called thummo. So I 
when he discussed this to me because he was wearing only one robe so it was not very and it was quite cold baba ji had made sure that i used to wear uh, woolen blankets which he had cut for a hole in the middle for the neck and a cap and turban and all that he said you will fall sick so i was i said ah, that's fascinating can you teach me thumu he said it is not so important to learn thumu you see what have i attained nirvana by learning thumu no but i can control the uh, the temperature okay then he said something extraordinary he said that is not the same as that fire that touched your navel last week so i said how do you know because nobody knows except me and baba ji so how does he know that the fire touched my navel last week he said me i and your baba ji have a different mode of contact we don't meet each other but we each other but we keep in touch with each other i said how he said by the mind you won't understand these matters it takes some time by and by gradually you will begin to understand what it is he said i can give you a hint when the mind becomes absolutely quiet and calm and even though outwardly it seems to be ruffled because of circumstances deep down when you meditate if you see that it is very very still and quiet and calm such a mind immediately reflects the thoughts of people who are around you whether you want to take it or you don't want to take it it is your business you can cut it off if you like but but suddenly you will say you will you will you will experience a thought which doesn't belong to you and you can be sure that it is coming from someone in the room from somewhere if it is only a hint but there are ways and means to practice and perfect the art of again he told me but it is not so important the most important thing is to attain nirvana which is freedom from all the bondages and conditionings of this world so so i lived with baba ji like that for some uh months in that cave in charana paduka once in a while going to uh, crossing the river and going to mauni baba's cave Mauni Baba's cave is on the way to the temple of Nilakanta in the Nilkant hills which is on the other side of the Ganga and whenever baba ji went and stayed in the cave which is called Mauni Baba's cave it has three layers one cave is there if you go down the steps there is another cave and if you go further down there is a third cave inside but whenever baba ji lived in the cave Uh, mauni baba used to go up to nilkant and live there so that he would be free to be there and there was a brahmachari who used to serve us look after us bring water clean the place give me food he didn't want food and so on and then from there we used to walk further up uh, sometimes on the banks of the ganga through lakshman jhula further up to dev prayag and back and so on on one of these trips it was quite evening when we approached vashishta gufa by the time we reached it, we were not coming from the road coming from those small paths on the banks of the ganga which are called by the locals pagdandi rastas we pagdandi means you have to have a stick to move move in that area there are no buses nothing it's small paths so we walked on that path and we came near vashishta gufa so i told baba ji so we'll spend the night at vashishta gufa that brahmachari is there he said no 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 we will spend the night at arundhati cave so that's the first time i saw or heard about the arundhati cave so i looked up and above the from the ganga i climb on rocks and there there is a small cave called arundhati cave it's still there and only two people can sit or sleep in that it's a very small cave so we slowly climbed up went to the arundhati cave baba ji said gave me the axe and said go and find some dry twigs to light the fire so i went and got some twigs he said if you are hungry you can go down to vachistha gufa have some food from that uh, brahmachari there and come up so after gathering the food and lighting the dhuni i went down and met swami ji and i said uh, 
I said, I said, Baba Ji is there. So he said, I will also come. He came and he bowed down, did namaskaram and came back. So I stayed in the night there. Now you must understand those days, uh, the forest area was quite large. Now much of it has depleted in Rishikesh and other areas. And wild elephants used to roam near Mauni Baba's cave. And in this Arundhati cave and Vashishta Gufa areas, leopards were very common at night. So, Babaji always told me, don't go out at night unless you tell me. Don't go alone. So, I had not encountered a leopard till then, but uh, the warning was there, so I was careful. Now, this Arundhati cave is a very, very long cave. It, it, it is, uh, must be about... Uh, 10 feet in length maybe, not more than that, and about uh, maybe 6 feet or 7 feet in width, becoming narrower as you go inside. And in front of that, on the mouth, Babaji built up the dhuni. I, I helped him to build up the dhuni and we lit the fire and he would sit there and meditate and I was supposed to sleep inside. I would sleep inside with my feet towards him and he would sit facing the dhuni and looking out. And below was the Ganga. Living in Arundhati cave, I had learned many ways to meditate. And one of them was, Babaji said, just sit and look at the river. Follow the river as it moves. Don't think of anything else. So that's open eye meditation. I learned several things living there. But what I want to tell you are two extraordinary incidents that happened to me during my stay in the Arundhati cave. Two really extraordinary. Some of One of them is so unbelievable that people wonder if it's fact or fiction. But you must remember that fact is stranger than fiction many times. All fiction is produced from fact, which is sometimes so strange that one doesn't even know if it is fact or fiction. And this happened one night. Uh, no, before that I will tell you the other story. One day I was sitting there and meditating. My attention was fixed in the Ajna Chakra, which is the middle of the forehead. It is also called Bhru Madhya, meditating. Now, from childhood, from my young age, I was very fond of masala dosa. Now, for some reason, when I was sitting and trying to meditate on Om, and the Ajna Chakra, the only image that was coming was masala dosa. So, I felt that this nice smell of masala dosa. Somebody, maybe after many years of being deprived from natural food, I mean that kind of food. So, Babaji suddenly woke me up and said, are you meditating on the Ajna Chakra? I said, yes. Does Ajna Chakra look like Masala Dosa? I said, Babaji, I can't help it. This image is coming into my head. I cannot help it. He said, I think what you should do is to go tomorrow. I will take you somewhere where you have as many Masala Dosas as you want and get rid of this craving. So, the next day he takes me to there is a Madras cafe in Rishikesh on the other side and gets two masala doshas which I finish in few minutes. The third also is ordered but I can't eat it because I am already full. He said, are you satisfied with the masala dosa? I said, yes. Okay, now get rid of it. From that time, that inordinate desire and craving for that particular food item is dissolved from my mind. Now, this is what is called the Tantra way, the Tantric way, where you satisfy your urges temporarily so that you know what it is and you are free of it. Because many a time, because we have not satisfied that urge, it keeps on bothering us. And as we move forward in the spiritual field, it becomes a big obstacle. So, the Tantra system is Bhogo Yogayate, which means, Babaji taught me this, which enjoy, understand and then let go. The problem comes when you cannot let go. All the time enjoying and not being able to let go. So therefore, for such practices, a guru, 
or a teacher is required. Otherwise, one may fall into the bottomless pit and always get stuck there in the pool. We cannot come out. So this was a wonderful experience which I had with Babaji. It also confirmed my understanding that he understood every passing thought that flickered through my mind even for a second. Of course, he didn't say it, but I knew it. And therefore, I was learning how to keep my mind free from thoughts which are disturbing. Because I thought if I get it, he will immediately sense it. It was like someone watching you with a microscope. I knew that he wouldn't punish me for it, but I knew that he, my, my heart was an open book to this great being. And because of that, I was guided properly and I was able to advance myself spiritually. Now the second experience, which is really unbelievable, this is not unbelievable, but that one is really unbelievable. One day, one night, I was sleeping in the cave and Babaji was sitting in front of the dhuni, meditating. He, he was sitting steady with his eyes open, I could see him in that state. Now I was lying down behind the cave at the end of the cave with my eyes closed, I was fast asleep. Somewhere in the middle of the night, I heard a sound which was like a thunderclap, as if there is going to be rain, a heavy thunderclap, very, very loud, like an explosion. So I look up, and I see something like the moon on the other side of the skyline and that it is lit from inside just like the moon and it is moving forward and as it moves forward it is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. So I wake up fully, I am completely alert wondering what is this thing that is coming and the whole thing comes it becomes so big, almost this big and lands right on the dhuni with another thunder clap so loud that I almost am shaken out of my uh, consciousness actually and I am looking at Babaji and wondering what is happening out of fear and then very slowly there's a beautiful perfume-like thing wafting from there. Very slowly, this round globe thing opens. It opens like as if it is two doors which are opening. And inside that, I see a very, very strange sight. Inside that sits a big cobra-like structure. It's like a cobra. It's huge. It has a hood. It is much bigger than any snakes that we see and it is colored like it's like as if it is made of glass and it is colored electric blue like the sparks that you see in when you strike two wires together complete electric blue and transparent and it's saying something which I cannot follow it's like hissing sound and Babaji is sitting there looking at it and it seemed to me as if there is a conversation going on between this object and Babaji. And I am lying there shivering with fright, not knowing what to do. Either this is a dream, but it cannot be a dream, but I feel I am awake or it is something which is in my brain. So I am either going mad, completely crazy or this is real. If it is real, what is it that I am seeing before me? something that looks like a cobra which is made of blue deep violet blue glass and it is shining and it is making some kind of a noise which is like a hiss almost and Babaji seems to be communicating with it because he is nodding his head and he is showing his hands and then suddenly he turns to me at the cave and says Itarao. so shivering with great fear I go towards uh, the dhuni where this is then he says bend down and do namaskaram do pranams so I go 
from far and do uh, namaskaram to something whatever it is i don't know what it is and the the snake that snake like thing with its hood bends down and touches my head and as it touches my head i feel a certain thrill going through my system and for a moment i understand that this is not a thing from the earth but something come from a realm about which we have no idea and then the thing closes there is another thunder clap and it's gone gone meaning it goes up becomes smaller and disappears now this looks like a science fiction story but this is my experience of what i had in the arundhati cave in the morning i ask baba ji what is this that i saw who is this he says this comes from a realm which is called nagaloka and this is the person who is the head of that world which is called nagaloka and i said we have only read of nagaloka in puranas or in some other textbooks but do it really exists he said did you see what you saw or you didn't i said i saw if you see it and if you experience it you better believe it he said and then later on many days later we had various discussions on different realms and the, what i remember very clearly he said it is the height of arrogance that the human being thinks that this little speck of dust which we call the bhuloka the earth is the only place where living beings are he said that is the height of arrogance of the human being to think so so one day while sitting outside the cave at charan paduka with baba ji he suddenly turned around and said ah now tomorrow we are going to leave for tolingmat on the way to kailash i was very excited because as i said earlier there was the old buddhist lama who was living in one of the caves in charan paduka he had mentioned about tolingmat to me he said that across the border into tibet not too far from uh, the indian border there was a famous uh, buddhist monastery called the tolingamat uh, i was very excited because i had always thought of walking into tibet and seeing monasteries and sadhus and lamas there so baba ji said yes we are going tomorrow so all preparations were made in the morning we went to see the raval ji now i was uh, waiting for what the reaction would be because the raval ji had uh, first of all discouraged me from being there saying that there are no genuine sadhus or no genuine he had not heard of any genuine yogis and that i was wasting my time looking for a guru and so on so i thought what would be the reaction when uh, baba ji meets the raval ji so we went i was surprised because the raval ji stood up and uh, prostrated before baba ji and said um, oh this young gentleman has found you mm? and baba ji said yes i have found him he said yeah i was discouraging him from falling into the hands of false gurus and frauds baba ji said that was a good thing to do so but the most surprising aspect of this was that baba ji was speaking in malayalam and that also in the northern malayalam accent northern side of malayalam which the uh, the raval ji also spoke and from a nambudri family from payanur which is in the northern end of kerala uh, they spoke for some time and then all preparations were made raval ji said we are making all preparations baba ji don't worry and so on we also provided with uh, mm, uh, nepalese uh, man i think his uh, name was some bahadur i can't remember that not teg bahadur some bahadur anyway so this man was supposed to accompany us and uh, uh, marwadi merchant uh, provided us with tents and horses Uh, so we started out uh, armed with uh, a gas stove 
and in kerosene oil and so on. But before we did that, while we were going, I sat down quietly and Babaji was standing up and looking at the river. I asked him, Babaji, are you from Kerala? Are you a Malayali? So, are you a Malayali? Babaji said, why do you ask? I said, it's because you are speaking in perfect Malayalam with uh, Nambudri. He said, no, I am not from Kerala. Oh, then he said, so you must be thinking the same which most people think, that Babaji must be omniscient. He knows any language in the world. He said, that is not the case. He said, there is no human being on this earth, born of a father and mother, biologically, who is omnipresent, omnipotent or omniscient. He said, there are always limitations. There is no such thing. I said, then how do you know the Malayalam which you are talking, since you are not from Kerala? He said, but there are ways in which you can connect to somebody else's brain and understand temporarily what that person is thinking of, tune into somebody's brain and use his knowledge. That's all one can do. Nobody can be omniscient. So I said, okay. I said, that is not a full explanation. I still want to ask you, where are you from? He laughed and said, we'll discuss that later. Anyway, so the next day we started off. Babaji, uh, the Nepalese uh, Gurkha, uh, I started calling him simply Bahadur, so Bahadur and myself, plus two horses, one for carrying the tents and other things and one for emergencies, some cooking pots uh, and uh, gas stove and so on, with a uh, good supply of drinking water, which was put in pots and tied on both sides of the pony, started off. Now. This path which we were taking is not frequented by most people who go to Kailash. It's the old route which is supposed to have been the route taken by Sri Rama when he visited Kailash in the ancient times. So now hardly anybody goes. Anyways, about 35 kilometers from Mana, you come across the Indian border from where Tibet starts. It's all controlled now by the Indo-Tibetan border police. That time there was not much of a police or army presence there. Anyway, so we went up to Vashishta Gufa, camped at Vashishta Gufa for the night and next morning we started off towards Kailash. Now the path to take is to follow the course of the Saraswati river. There is no other way you can find out. Babaji apparently knew the path and this Bahadur who came with us, he said he had once travelled with some merchants trading in Tibet, across Tibet. So we passed the Saraswati river, we came to a place called Keshav Prayag where the Saraswati meets uh, Alkananda and then from there we started. There was no path actually, we had to climb over rocks, many places and walk along river followed us throughout, it was beautiful. And then the sights of the Himalayas are something that's so thrilling. At a distance I could see the uh, Nila Parvat, the blue mountain. We have Nilagiris here, but they are not half as blue as the Nila Parvat. And snow covered, other peaks jetting out from the scene. And nothing but snow all around, hardly any vegetation and becoming colder and colder day by day. In about uh, 13 days or so, travelling this way, camping at places where there was a small clearing, where the, this Bhadur used to clear up the snow and the ice and pitch the tent and cook food for us, we proceeded. Babaji, of course, as usual, never slept, but I slept soundly throughout the journey because I was dead tired. Meditation, of course, I, every now and then Babaji would wake me up from meditation saying, this is not Turiya, this is Shushupti, deep sleep. Anyway, so we passed a wonderful time. I had some discussions also with him during that period. 
part of it I have written in the autobiography, but not the whole thing. One was about the Nath Panth to which he belonged. And the other was his connection with Sri Guru Babaji, who was his guru. So this, finally we came to the Mana Pass, the famous Mana Pass. We crossed the Mana Pass. It took us a whole day to go because the Mana Pass is 18,000 uh, miles above sea level. So we had to cross it. While we were crossing, there was a terrible storm. And somehow we managed, although I was shivering. The Gurkha had a lot of experience in that, so he was fine. He wore a thick coat, but Babaji, as usual, wore only the small cloth which he normally wore, bare-bodied. And I was wearing thickly clothed in all kinds of woolen things and an woolen cap and a muffler. Babaji said, you better wear it, otherwise you'll fall sick. So we went. Finally, we cleared the Mana Pass and came down to the Tibetan side in about two days. Suddenly, we found that the temperature had uh, become not so severe and the earth was reddish, a lot of red mud there. And people were growing small little herbs and little bit of vegetable and all that. In about four days, halting in the night and so forth, we reached Tolingmat. Now this Tolingmat is in, situated in Tibet. One of the most important features of the Tolingmat is that it has a Buddha who, whose head touches the roof of the monastery. It's a huge Buddha. And also around Buddha, in that monastery, there are so many other Hindu gods and goddesses, Bhadrakali and Hanuman and uh, other devis and you name them, all the Dasha Mahavidyas are there. Uh, but the Lamas only do puja to all these. And there was a head Lama who is known as the Rinpoche, who welcomed Babaji as if you knew him for a long time. And uh, asked us to stay and be uh, their guests at the monastery. But Babaji never stayed in anywhere like that, so we had to pitch a tent and stay just outside the monastery. The camp, the tent was quite comfortable for about three, four people. So three of us were there. Horses were tied outside. And uh, we spent the night. The night, I had a wonderful discussion with Babaji about various things. One of them was, that the Lamas of uh, Tholingmat believed that originally Badrinath was in Tholingmat. And since it was inaccessible to most people, later on it was shifted to the place where it is now. Uh, of course, the Lama believed that Badrinarayan is a form of Buddha because he sits in Padmasan. But uh, that may be his belief, we, can, we are not sure. I asked Babaji about this. He said, we don't enter into such controversies. Sufficient to say that if you have a religious bent of mind, if you lead a good life and if you practice meditation, that's sufficient. It doesn't matter whether Buddha is Narayana or Narayana is Buddha. Don't get into these controversies. So there was no more discussion on that subject. Anyway, spend some time there. And uh, then after, I also saw some uh, very strange sight. There are these tall Tibetan men who come from the province of Kham. If you write in English, it can be spelled as K-H-A-M, Kham district. They're very tall people. And they're usually messengers who take messages from one monastery to another. Now, these people had with them a long sticks, which is like a pole. They use for pole vault. And when they carried messages, they used to do a certain breathing exercise, hit the pole on the ground like a pole vault and travel quite a distance before landing. So this is why they were appointed as messengers, because they had learned the art of almost flying with the stick. This is the nearest levitation that I have seen in my life, apart from the magic tricks that are shown on stage. Anyway, so I saw them pushing taking a deep breath and moving quite a distance before again putting the pole down. These were the messengers of the monasteries. Anyway, so after spending about four days and having various discussions with uh, the Lamas about Buddhism and so on, 
Ravaji said, now we can start for Kailash. So we started off. We had reached Tolingwat and from there we had to go through another village. I think it was called uh, Dhamma or Dhamal or something. So we reached there in about six days. Altogether, we camped there at that little village. Altogether, we had traveled around 21 days starting from uh, Mana, Badrinath. Now we halted there for the night in a tent. And that night, I had such a serious fever. I had such a serious fever that uh, the temperature was so high that I started getting convulsions. So, Babaji said, no Kailash for you this time. We have to go back. I said, but Babaji, I wanted to go to Kailash. He said, you might have wanted to go to Kailash. You will go to Kailash after many, many years with a big group of people. But this time you will travel from the Nepal side. So I gave up. Anyway, I was very ill. I had high temperature. I was shivering. In fact, I thought I was having, uh, what you call, when you have high fever, hallucinations. Uh, because I was lying in the, uh, I was there sick for at least four days. I was lying in the tent on my little wooden uh, plank. When um, suddenly I saw the tent door open. Now the Lama was giving me medicines for the last four days, but this didn't seem to have any effect. I was still having high temperature. Um, I saw somebody coming inside from the uh, tent, from the opening door of the tent. Now this person who came from the door was doesn't didn't look like a human being. He looked more like uh, what shall we compare with? He looked like a gorilla, something like a gorilla. I couldn't see clearly because the only light inside the tent was a small kerosene lamp which was lit, hurricane lamp which was lit by Bahadur. So in this faint light, all I could see was there was this thing looking like a monkey or a gorilla, but big size, like a human being. As it, it walked in and it was making a peculiar whining, thin pitched, uh, sharp pitched voice, like that kind of sound. And it, it, it or he kept coming towards, when it passed the light, the hurricane lamp, I noticed that it had, body was full of fur and there were no clothes. And the fur was kind of um, light, uh, dark cream colored fur. Like it came straight towards me where I was lying. I was really paralyzed with fear. Uh, it looked at me and again made that whining noise. My mind went back to some comic books where the Yeti comes in the Himalayas and tries to kill people and so on. So I was paralyzed with fear. but. It did nothing of the sort. It came near me and pushed something into my mouth. Mm, some very gooey stuff like chewed chewing gum uh, or melted chewing gum or some very, very sweet stuff in my mouth. Pushed it in with its finger and then ran out. When it was running out, the Bahadur came running in saying, mountain man, man, pahadi admi, pahadi admi. He came running inside. He was also very fried. He said, are you all right? I said, I'm all right. And I was chewing that stuff. I swallowed it. The whole night, I could not sleep because all the time I was looking at the, at the entrance to the tent, wondering when the creature was going to come. Anyway, to cut the long story short, in about two hours time, I fell asleep without my knowledge, unconsciously. And when I woke up in the morning, there was no temperature, no fever. I was perfectly all right. So Babaji said, okay, we pack up. We are going back to Badrinath. I said, Babaji, I'm all right now. He said, I know you are all right. We are going back. So we 
most of the time on the way back I was sitting on the horse and going. So then I asked Babaji, Babaji do you think what I saw was a Yeti? He said, let's not have a discussion. Nobody is going to believe you. Most people don't believe in its existence. And if you say you had high fever when you saw it, they would think that you were having some kind of a hallucination. So don't discuss the subject. I said, no harm if I say I saw it. He said, that is left to you. So we came back to Badrinath and uh, uh, it took us, I think, around uh, 18 days, much less time than we took to go there. Around 18 days, we were back at Badrinath and back to the cave at Charanapaduka. After I reached there one morning, I went to see the Ravalji. I told Babaji, I'm going to see the Ravalji. He said, go. So I went to Ravalji. Uh, and uh, after saying Namaskara and all that, I said, how do you know Babaji? Because you are talking as if you are familiar with him. Uh, he said, well, I know him as a genuine uh, yogi who lives in these areas, but I don't know anything more about him. But my forefathers have said three successors and before that my father has said that they have also met him. So we don't know how long, how old he is, although he looks around 35. He's a great yogi, you are lucky that he found you, because generally I have heard that he did not accept any disciples. So you are very lucky. So I said, okay. I said, then, uh, is he from Kerala? What do you suspect? He said, no, no, I don't think he's from Kerala. But he was talking Malayalam. He said, that is great yogis can do what they want. So I said, so you believe in great yogis because you are discouraging me. There is no... He said, I discouraged you because you don't fall into the wrong hands. There are so many Ganja sadhus around here. There are so many people who are very learned and scholarly who pretend to be great yogis. So I was only trying to help you out. So I said, all right. So he said, since you are going, please take some prasad with you and go back to the cave. And if you tell Babaji that it is Badri Narayan's prasad, he will also eat it. Otherwise, I know that he doesn't usually eat. So I said, all right. So I thanked him, took the prasad and went back to the cave. Now this Charanapaduka, a very interesting place. After I... Uh, after many years, both things came true. One is I took a whole group of people and went to Kailash. Two, I, whenever we went to Badri or Kedar with a group, we used to go to Charanapaduka and go near the caves and meditate and walk around. Many of our friends have sat with me and meditated at Charanapaduka because we, I believe that there is a strong presence of Sri Guru Babaji in that place. This is the importance of Charanapaduka. The Jains also come there because for them it is a holy place. One of their Tirthankaras has come there, maybe Paraswanath, I am not sure and has done tapasya there, so they have two footmarks which they consider to be the Charnapadukas of their Tirthankaras. So many Jains come there on pilgrimage. If you move a little further up, the whole right side is dotted with caves. If you go further down, there is a glade where horses, you will see wild horses uh, grazing there. It's completely green. It's a very beautiful place. Now. Those who would want to go there, the best way to do would be to go to Badrinath, walk along the road that approaches Badrinath, but in the reverse direction, opposite direction. And then you find steps going up the hills from there on the right side. If you stand there and look straight on the opposite direction, you will see the Nilakant Parvat. You will see a photograph of the Nilakant Parvat on the cover page of my autobiography, especially when the sun rises, it's a beautiful sight to see because only the top becomes golden and the rest is all white and beautiful. It's a, a sight for poets, for artists, uh, 
for people who enjoy nature to go to such places. Even if you are not religiously inclined and you don't want to go for a pilgrimage, I think it's a great idea to visit Badri Kedar, especially in the season when the snow has not fully melted. You can see these beautiful peaks when the sun rises and the sun sets. And the whole atmosphere is so different that you would automatically get a meditative feeling. And if you sit down and meditate, there is the influence of those these great beings around. Now, having said that, while staying at Charnapaduka, I used to take short walks with Babaji towards Vyasa Gufa and towards what is known as Swarga Arohini. Swarga Arohini is little beyond the Vyasa Gufa. That's supposed to be the place that goes on to Alkapuri from where Alakananda starts. And the Puranas say that when the Pandavas, after the Kurukshetra war and after Yudhishthira laid down his, uh, gave up his kingdom and decided to walk out, having put his son in place, they all the Pandavas walked up the same route from Mana and continued to pass through, go to the Bhim Tal near Saraswati river and walk towards the, uh, what is it called, uh, Alkapuri. On the way, there is a spot from where, where Yudhishthira had, is supposed to have fallen. Fallen means where he, the Purana says, where he was lifted up into heavens. Now, therefore, that place is called Swarga Arohi. That means a place from where he went off to Swarga. There's an interesting story. Yudhishthira had a dog, a pet dog, which was very dear to him. So, the story is, that when the chariot came, when the Pushpa Vimana came to take Yudhishthira up to Swarga, he said, no, I cannot come alone. I have to take my dog. So he said, but the dog has not done the punya that you have done. He said, either the dog comes with me or I don't go. So finally, the pilots of the Pushpa Vimana had to agree to take the cargo, the dog also along. So the dog was also booked to Swarga. Interesting story because Yudhishthira, you will notice, was a great king who after the Kurukshetra battle, when he became the king, he decided that he would not rule the kingdom. He was very unhappy. He said, what is the use of a kingdom where so many people have been killed? So many of my relatives are dead. What kind of a kingdom should I rule over? In spite of he being told by his brothers that it is not your fault that they were killed, he insisted that he would not rule the kingdom. He would rule only as long as his son is ready to take over. And then he moved off into the mountains to the Badrinath and Kedar towards his complete freedom. Therefore, he is referred to in the ancient Puranas as Dharmaraja, the, the, the king of Dharma. How many kings do we see nowadays who would want to give up his seat or his kingdom? It's as if they put favicol on the seats when they sit down and they cannot get up. So these are the great kings who are not only rulers but also great saints, people whose mind had expanded. Now I'm going to tell you about my visit with Babaji to the Valley of Flowers. It's a beautiful valley of flowers, which has been so much nowadays in the, it's in the modern, in the daily news, because lots of tourists have started going to the Valley of Flowers. And then from there to a place called Hem Kund Sahib, which is now considered to be <coughs> a holy place for the Sikhs, although everyone can go there. First, we'll start with the Valley of Flowers. So one day Babaji said, ah, now we will start for the Valley of Flowers. Now he used to make fun of me saying that there are roller skates on your feet, you can't stay in one place. But actually he had super speed roller skates on his feet. He could not stay for more than four days in one place, he would start off. So he said, we'll go to the Valley of Flowers. 
So naturally the only mode of transport with Babaji was walking. So we walked from Badrinath, took two days to come, two, three days to come to Pandukeshwar. Then from Pandukeshwar we walked on to a place called Govindghat. The Govindghat, from ancient times there has been a small Gurudwara, which is basically a tent. It's a tent. Now they have built it and made it into a very big building, but in those days it was only a tent Gurudwara. And there was one Ragi. Ragi is, is the word used for the Pujari kind, people who look after the Gurudwara among the Sikhs. They also read the Guru Granth Sahib, which is the holy book of the Sikhs, uh, in a particular Raga, so they are called Ragis. So there was this gentleman. So I went to him and I stayed for two, three days in the Gurudwara. One very interesting thing about a Gurudwara, which is good for everybody to know, is that in any Gurudwara, in any part of India, even abroad, if you have a visa to go, is that you can go and stay in a Gurudwara for three days uh, and you will also get boarding and lodging food also will be given to you for three days free of charge. Nobody will ask you what religion you belong to, where are you coming from, three days is allowed. If you want to stay for more than three days, then you will have to get special permission. So the kitchen which is called the langar is open all the time. Anybody who goes is supposed to be fed, which is part of the Sikh religion. So I went to Govindghat and stayed in the Gurudwara with the Ragi. We got very friendly. He taught me many things about the Sikh religion. Actually, when I came back, he became so friendly. He said, you must go to the Akali Takht in Amritsar and become a Sikh. I said, I'm not ready to become a Sikh. I only want to study about the Sikh religion. Anyway, so from him, I found out the route, how to go to... Uh, no, no, that was uh, later. Babaji was with me, so there was no problem. So both of us stayed in the Gurdwara. And I also found that the Ragi was very respectful of Babaji. Whenever he saw him, he used to call him uh, as Mahan and Guru and so on, which the Sikhs rarely use because for them their Gurus are only their Gurus starting with uh, Guru Nanak to Guru Govind Singh. From there we, want, we went to a place called Ghangriya. That is the next stop. In Gangriya, this beautiful river flowing under the bridge, it's a very interesting place. It's very few hotels are there now, but in those days there was nothing. But there was a sadhu, a Bairagi sadhu, belonging to uh, the Juna Akada, who had a little kutir there. So Babaji knew him or he knew Babaji. So we spent about two nights at Gangriya with him. He would light the dhuni and sit and talk. But he was a sadhu who, many of the Juna Akada sadhus, they smoke uh, uh, the chillam, which is the uh, hashish or ganja or whatever you want to call it. But otherwise he was perfectly alright, but this habit he had. When he offered it to me, I said, I don't use this stuff. So he said, yeah, I know, I know, you're Babaji's uh, disciple, they are all Rajyogis, you don't require this, things like that. We spent some time there. Then he said, why don't you ask Babaji to give you Sri Vidya? I said, Babaji gives me what he wants, I never ask him for anything. He said, no, no, but you should ask, it will help you. So I said, I'll see if there is the right opportunity, then I will ask him. And then anyway, so from there we uh, proceeded to the left. Now from Gangria there are two roads. The left road goes to the Valley of Flowers and the right one, which is quite a stiff climb, goes to Hemkund Sahib. So first we went to the Valley of Flowers. Valley of Flowers is the most beautiful thing you can imagine. It's as if there are different flowers. I think most flowers in the world are there. And they are all in different patches. It is as if somebody is doing gardening. But there are no gardeners, it's a natural thing. One stretch you will find certain flowers. Another stretch you will find certain flowers. So it's like 
a patchwork, colored patchwork of flowers. You should go in the right season, actually. I can't remember, it's probably August, September or something like that, when the flowers are in full bloom. And there are some flowers which give such a beautiful odd smell, perfume, that uh, you get half intoxicated by the smell of the perfume. So it's a it's a completely a place out of this world, and very often you see botanists going around from foreign countries trying to see which species these flowers are, because it seems there are flowers in the valley of flowers which are nowhere else in India except perhaps in Switzerland or some other exotic place. Pavaji took me around, and I was extremely surprised when I found that like speaking Malayalam to the Ravalji, he knew every flower, its botanical name, its source, its species, its genus, which I don't know, so I cannot explain it to you. He said this is called Edelweiss, he said this is called the the uh, blue uh, something, I, I don't know. So he, he had such a knowledge of uh, botany and flowers and nature that I was it's mind-boggling. You cannot imagine a human being with so much understanding of so many things put together. Anyway, then he took me to a place of a, a cliff from where, in 1941, I believe, a botanist, a lady botanist from abroad, from Europe, fell down and died while looking for some species. It still made us a plague with her name. I can't remember the name now. I have mentioned it in my autobiography, so the thing is, I never keep a diary. I have never recorded anything in a piece of paper. But when I started writing the autobiography, every time I sat and wrote, all the information used to flow very naturally and come. But now if you ask me the names, I can't remember. You have to, I can read it from the autobiography, but I cannot remember offhand. Anyway, so. Then Babaji led me to a place where there is a lovely little cave surrounded by hills. He said he and Sri Guru have come and sat there and meditated very often. It's such a cozy and wonderful place that suddenly you are cut off from the cold, extreme cold around. And I found that my meditation was proceeding in a different direction than normal. Uh, there was a kind of half sleep kind of feeling when you sat down, floating kind of feeling. So when I expressed this to Babaji that this meditation is quite different, it's like like falling asleep but not asleep, but very pleasant. He said that is because of the uh, smell coming from some exotic flower around that is creating this kind of effect on my brain. Anyway, then we came back to uh, Ghangriya, spend the night again in this uh, uh, Juna Akada Sadhu's place. And then the next day morning, we started off going to Hemkund Sahib. We decided to do the whole stretch in one day. It was quite a tough climb. Normally, people stop for a short while at some place, which I forget the name, and then go the next day and come back. We decided to go the whole hogs, completely go the same day, climb up and reach Hemkund Sahib. So we travelled, travelled means walked, trekked. And I found that there were, even in those days, hundreds of Sikh pilgrims travelling up Hemkund Sahib, everyone saying, Shashri Akal, Vaheguru, Vaheguru, and going up. And in many points they would set up small tents and distribute food to the pilgrims, okay. Anyway, finally, after trekking for a whole day, by evening we reached Hemkund Sahib. Now the Hemkund Sahib, the name Hemkund means uh, uh, the lake of ice, Hemkund. And it's actually a lake of ice. There is a small portion where you can see the water, the rest is all frozen. And you are surrounded by these beautiful snow-clad mountains on all sides, wherever you look. And there were some 
uh, really religious Sikh pilgrims who were jumping into the water to have a bath. I asked Babaji, should we have a dip? He said, are you crazy? You get sick. So I abstained from going into the lake. But it's a beautiful lake, beautiful sight. And it's so quiet and calm that the mind goes into a meditative state very, very naturally. We went to the Gurdwara. There's also a temporary little Gurdwara which was a tent and had hot khichdi and papad, that's what I remember. And then from there, Babaji said, four kilometers beyond, four or five kilometers, there is an old Lakshman temple which is abandoned and nobody was doing any pujas or anything there. He said, let's go to this temple and spend the night for two, three nights and meditate and come back. I said, all right. So we went. It is a complete small little temple, totally dilapidated. There's an image which they claim to be the image of Lakshmana. That's the only temple for Lakshmana, I think, anywhere individually. And the 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 idol was looking very dirty and unattended and unlooked after. So Babaji said, let's clean it. So we fetched some water from the nearby. There are waterfalls here and there, tiny, tiny waterfalls coming, very beautiful. Took some water in the Kamandalu and got it nicely cleaned. And we spent the night there. All the three nights, we had a beautiful meditation. Babaji explained to me the different uh, sects that belong to the Nath Panth and how, how many Nath Panth ashramas or mathas are there in India now, starting with Gorakhpur and so on. And we had a very, very useful time apart from the beauty and the meditative excellence of that place. The story is, somewhere in his writings, Guru Gobind Singh, who is the last Guru of the Sikhs, has said that in his previous birth, some previous birth, he had come to Hemkund Sahib and meditated in that little place where the present Lakshman temple is there. This is the story, which is why all the Sikhs go to Hemkund Sahib. From that, another uh, hmm, legend has sprung up that Guru Gobind Singh in his previous life was also Lakshman. So we, this are, we cannot authenticate these stories. These are our popular beliefs. But the fact is that there is an old Lakshman temple in Hemkund Sahib. And Hemkund Sahib is one of the most beautiful places where one can go and meditate. But unfortunately, Nobody can stay there for more than a day or two because it is extremely cold. And in any case, only three or four months in a year. After that, there is no Gurudwara, nothing there. Everybody winds up and comes down because the whole place is completely covered with snow. It is 15,500 or so feet above sea level. This is Hemkund Sahib. Anyway, so we came back again, spent the night in Ghangriya with the Sadhu and then walked to Govind Ghat, from Govind Ghat to Pandukeshwar and spent some time there in the, the Pandukeshwar is the temple where the Pandavas are supposed to have halted on their way to Badrinath. So we spent some time there and then we decided, Babaji decided that we would go to the Panchakedars. Now, most people know only of one Kedar is Kedarnath. Thing is that is the most popular of the Kedars where people go and it's the most famous and of course it is the biggest. But there are other Kedars which are including Kedarnath, they are called Pancha Kedars. So there are four more Kedars. One of them is uh, Madhmaheshwar. The other is Rudranath. The third is uh, Tunganath and the fourth, I um, can't remember right now the name. Anyway, there are these four Kedars. So Babaji said, now we are visiting the four Kedars and then finally we will go to Kedarnath. I had never visited Kedarnath before. 
it was not we have not we hadn't traveled to that area till then so we started off from pandukeshwar walking along turning taking a right turn and then continuing to walk we passed many small villages and in the evening we reached i think it was madhmaheshwar this is the problem the names seem to escape anyway one of the kedars let's say we reached there but on the way the scene was so so beautiful no we halted in between in a small village where the village head came to welcome baba ji so i knew that he must be very well known in that area as he has traveled a lot so finally we came there i think it was in madhmaheshwar before that next day we walked on to madhmaheshwar where again in the small village we were met by the village head the the sarpanch who came with a lot of followers saying baba ji has come and they all prostrated brought food brought uh, water brought flowers wild flowers and baba ji showed me many of those trees there he said they're all herbal uh, in content and they can be made into important ayurvedic and siddha medicines so he showed me all around and here and there you saw beautiful green and blue lakes and the villages were so simple they were worshiping in little little gram devatas everywhere and offered food to whoever passed that way because hardly anybody came that way so the pagdandi rasta there no motorable roads anywhere another interesting thing i found was there is an ayurvedic uh, gum a resin called shilajit which is used in medicines i saw for the first time uh, shilajit coming out of certain rocks it's a kind of a mineral like uh, thing baba ji showed me this is shilajit this is the source of the ayurvedic medicine usually used for kaya kalpa to rejuvenation anyway so we passed and spend some time in madhmaheshwar madhmaheshwar there was a priest who lived in the village so he came and he did puja for the shivling there it's a very simple shivling with a stone granite structure around now in these beautiful places the uh, ceramic tiles have not yet reached so the temples are very beautiful they don't look like bathrooms because no ceramic tiles and glazed tiles have ever reached there it's still made of granite and rock it's very beautiful anyway so from in madhmaheshwar we spend the night and we were on our way to rudranath the next day so on the whole by the time we reached uh, madhmaheshwar it has it would have taken us about 4 days i think 4 4 and a half days then we walked towards rudranath and rudranath is again one of the most important uh, of the panchakedars there the linga is very small the temple is completely dilapidated there is no puja being performed there is nobody in sight except a village which is 20 kilometers away so we went and uh, as we, it took us about 4 days or 5 days to reach from there to rudranath on the way while we were at madhmaheshwar the village sarpanch said that one yogi ji maharaj who used to live here has now shifted to rudranath so if you see him please offer our prostrations to him he told baba ji so i asked baba ji who is this great yogi ji maharaj he said there is a direct disciple of shri guru baba ji who is my guru bhai and he is also senior to me in a way he's from the south and he lives uh, he used to live for many years in madhmaheshwar now he has shifted to rudranath so he said probably we will meet him uh, in rudranath so so i said where is he from he said he's from the south so where is he from the south he said he used to live for many years in a place called tengashi which i knew it's uh, near uh, chengota side tengashi uh, where there is a waterfall also beautiful waterfall so i don't know his name but people used to refer to him as tengashi siddhar 
He is supposed to have lived there for many years and then Babaji told him, his guru Babaji, told him to shift to Mad Maheshwar and then to Rudranath. So I was very excited. I thought I will see some one more great yogi who is Babaji's uh, guru bhai. Anyway, we travelled. Now, before reaching Rudranath, we halted for the night in one uh, place where there is a lot of dilapidated temples and no village, nothing. So Babaji said, we, can, we can't walk today. It is about quite uh, dark. So we'll have to go the next day to Rudranath and we can reach there by morning next day. So I said, all right. So we halted in that place and we were, I was thinking, what about food for the night? I was just thinking in my mind. Now in Rudranath, there is a, not Rudranath, in this village where we stayed, a lot of dilapidated, broken down structures. So Babaji said, we can use one of these. As we approached a place which had a, like a, uh, like dharam shalas, which means granite uh, pillars, with a granite roof covered on all three sides. In front of that, suddenly we found there is a fire burning, dhuni. So I said to Babaji, there is a dhuni here, there must be somebody. He said, here there must be, who comes here? He was himself surprised. Normally he never gets, never used to get surprised about anything. As soon as we got in, from inside comes that Tenkashi Siddhar. I guessed it was him. A dark, very dark man, with short and well built, with a lot of uh, ashes on his face, with vibhuti. He comes out and greets uh, Maheshwarnath Babaji. They have a greeting in the Nath Panth called Alak Niranjan. So he says, Alak Niranjan. Babaji, Babaji is shocked. He says, oh, we thought we are going to find you in Rudranath. He said, yeah, yeah, I know. I was trying to keep your thoughts away from my mind. Otherwise, you would have discovered me long ago. This was a discussion. He said, come in. So we went inside. He asked me, you are from the south? He said, you are from Trivandrum. I said, yes. So Babaji has adopted you as your disciple. He said, ah, before that I must tell you, so since Tenkashi Siddhar was senior to Maheshwarnath Babaji, as soon as he saw him, he tried to do pranams to him. He did not allow, he said, Mahesh, you don't have to do this to me. So he didn't allow him to do that. Babaji told me, do pranams. So I did pranams. Then he said, uh, from Travandram, I said, yes. Travandram is the border of... Uh, Tamil Nadu. I said, yes. You know Tamil? Pesadiri. I said, Yedadiri, Vasikatiri, Pesadiri. I said, oh, very nice. He was very happy. He said, Wanga, Wanga. So he took us all inside and he told me, this great man never accepts his disciples. Usually you are a lucky fellow that he has taken you under his care. So we had a long chat. Then he said, this is your greatest surprise. I have made very good sambar rice and some puriyal for you. So I sat down and for the first time after so many uh, years, two years, I had lovely South Indian meal sitting with Tenkashi Siddhar. It was more than the talk. I think I was more impressed and affected by that food. Then we sat down and had a long chat about various things. And that uh, night, Sankashi Siddhar taught me a lot of things about the Tamil Siddhars, the South Indian system of uh, uh, Shiva Yoga. It's called Tamil Siddhars, belong to the Shaivite order of the South. And he also described to me this great book called Tirumantiram, which was written by a great sage called Tirumular. Uh, he said, in the Tirumantaram, you can find the complete A to Z technique and theory of the Kundalini Yoga and the chanting of what is called the Shiva Panchakshara, which is Shiva Panchakshara because it is Na Ma Shiva Ya, by letters. We add Om, so it's Om Namah Shiva. Of course, in Tamil, there is no Sha, there is a Chi, so it is Namah Shiva. So, this Panchakshara can be used. Each letter of the Panchakshara, this is all taught to me by Tenkashi Siddhar. 
uh, fixed to any one of our centers, inner centers which are called chakras and chanted in various combinations to bring about various effects inside us and outside us. He taught me that and he also told me the story of Tirumular. He said Tirumular was actually a disciple of Agastya, the great sage Agastya. So since Agastya had come down to the south and not come back for a long time, Tirumular decided to come from the Himalayas searching for Agastya. So as he was coming somewhere in the south, the south of Tamil Nadu, he came across a very a sight which made him very sad. A shepherd, which means people who take shepherds for sheep for grazing, had uh, died. And there were lots of goats standing around, feeling very unhappy, not crying like human beings, but crying. So this great yogi felt very sorry for them and wanting to make them happy. He decided to leave his body under the under the under a hollow tree and get into the body of this dead shepherd so that the sheep will be happy for a while. Now this activity in yoga is called in Tamil what you call Siddha Yoga. It's called Para Kaya Pravesha which means entering somebody else's body. 